ended. Good morning. Is everybody having a great time so far? It's a good morning, amen? This Super Bowl Sunday, yeah? Is anybody a Patriots fan out there? Don't, don't mention if you are. <laughs> We're going to pray for Pastor Frank. Uh, he's the lone Patriots fan this morning. Uh, we got any Falcons fans out there today? Yeah, we got a few. Come on. We're from the South. Sorry, Frank. Um, yeah, but, <laughs> but it's going to be a great Sunday today. I'm super excited, not just because it's Super Bowl Sunday, but because we are starting our series on abundance. And everything that you've ta- seen up there, for the next eight weeks, we're going to be talking about what abundance looks like. And it's based out of John 10.10 10, where Jesus said that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But he said, I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly, that you may have it to the full. And we're going to start today, and it's a super uh, exciting to me and a privilege of mine to introduce our speaker. Uh, I'm going to have him come on up. This is Dr. Clem Ferris. Why don't you give him a round of applause? He's no stranger to South Bay Church. Right. Uh, so glad to have him with us today. Um, our pastor, David Spiker, is really good friends with uh, Dr. Clem, uh, and uh, he hates that he can't be here today. He's really sick, so you guys please pray for him. Uh, he w- he texted me this morning, and he's like, I just can't even move. <laughs> I'm so sick, and I, I feel so bad for him. And I told him we would pray for him today, and I would have uh, uh, us all agree that, that God would heal him and touch his body today. But we just want to welcome uh, Pastor Clem. He's going to start us off and kick us off on this Abundant Series, and we're looking forward to what God has for us today. So why don't you give another warm welcome of applause Great. to Clem today, and glad to have you. I'll get your podium for you. Morning, South Bay. Good to be with you. Yeah, in ministry, you have to schedule your sicknesses, so we scheduled this a long time ago so that David <laughs> could be not, anyway, we, uh, we will be praying for him, and it's good to be with you, and it used to be sunny, warm Florida. What happened? <laughs> Everybody's got coats on. I know, in Florida, when it goes below 70, the park has come out, and he's that, that's so it's okay. Last Sunday, it was 20 degrees in Indiana, and this next Sunday, I'll be in New York, it'll be about 21 So here I am basking in the heat of 58. It's good. Good to be with you. These are good days. Good days in the kingdom. Lots happening. I kicked off the year in the nation of Wales where I've been going 28 years. And we had some incredible times with an apostolic team of the largest network in Wales. And things are getting ready to bust loose. Things are happening in the south of England. There's a real major move of the Holy Spirit in the south of England. In evangelism, people are getting saved on the streets um, by church people, not professionals, you know, and God is doing something. They're going to partner with New Wine Wales and roll it out into Europe, and man, these are the best days, and there is truly abundance coming into the kingdom of God. You got to get ready for it. I think David's right on line and the, and the leaders to prepare your hearts for the abundance that God wants to pour out. How many know if, if you're going to, if, if, if population is going to increase in Florida, we all got to keep, keep up with all the crazy roadworks, right? It was like, oh, they're widening another road. Why? More people are coming, more cars, right? It, it's a real pain, but it's kind of like in the church, we have to keep the infrastructure current and relevant so we can take the influx of people. That's what God's getting you ready for. So I want to just uh, kind of, Dave is not here, so I'm not even going to start with my first slide. Isn't that cool? I can get away with it. Don't tell him, Abby. Don't tell him I did that. He said he didn't even start with the first slide. But this was on my heart first thing this morning in Acts chapter 1. I just want to kind of set this. It's not up there, but... Uh, in Acts chapter 1, you know, the disciples came to Jesus, and they said, Lord, are you this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? To me, it was kind of like he says, Jesus, are you going to make Israel great again? Sorry, I had to play off that. I thought that was kind of current. Are you going to make Israel great again? <clears throat> and Jesus totally flipped on him. He didn't go political at all. He redirected them away from national restoration to pointing them towards the kingdom of God. That was pretty powerful. He said, no, <laughs> I'm not, let's not talk politics. He, uh, he went totally into another mode. He went into kingdom mode. And when he did that, he kind of shifted it into, into the, in what I call God's power grid. This is what, to, to kick off this whole series, I'm going to talk about God's power grid And the first thing he did is he pointed them to God's sovereignty. All power comes from God. Everything's under God. He said, it's not for you to know the times and the dates that the Father has set by his own authority. That's the first thing he said. It's not not about making Israel great again. He says, 
It's not for you to even know the times of the season, but God has them already set, and they're under his authority. He went totally sovereign on them. Church, we've got to get back and say, this thing's all under God's authority, everything. He is adjudicating. Everything is being superintended on planet Earth by our God in heaven. If not, we should not have sung the songs we just sang. Do you believe the songs you just sang? Well, then you've got to say, I guess the Bible's true. <laughs> then he redefined what their understanding of power actually is. We're looking at God's power grid and how abundance comes out of God's power grid. He says, don't worry about this. Not for you to know the times of the season God has under his authority, but you will receive power. That's pretty cool. He turned it right on them. God's all powerful and you will receive power. When? The Holy Spirit comes upon you. That is so good. Took them away from politics and their political gaze and fixed it on the spirit realm. That's where we got to stay focused, folks. You got to stay focused on the spirit realm. Our faith is not tied to whether nations rise or fall. Getting quiet in this Presbyterian church. That's okay. I'm used, I'm used to it. Our faith depends on the release of power that we experience just the way they did in the book of Acts. That our brothers, our ancient brothers received power. That's what we base our faith on. What they got, we got. I don't know if that's good English, but it sounds good. What they got, we got. The ability to move into God's purposes. And then he calls them into partnership. You're going to receive power if the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. He forms a partnership right there. You and I are going to work together. You'll receive power, then we go to work together. This is how this whole thing is going to roll out. This is the abundance comes out of the the power grid of God, with the Holy Spirit supplying the power and then us partnering with Jesus Christ. You'll be my witnesses, is what he said. Because God's going to claim total ownership of this deal, I'm telling you. He's going to claim total ownership of all actions on behalf of his kingdom. So there has to be some people in the earth that have been built into robust, strong believers who don't shrink back in a day when God begins assaulting unseen powers in the earth. God's going to go after some things, just like he did in the days of Egypt. He's going to assault false dimensions, false gods, false authorities. We have to be ready for let God do what he wants to do in the nations. If he wants to dismantle a nation, that's God's business. We'll receive power and partner with him and be witnesses. And then... He pushed them out of their little mind of it's all about us and our little nation. He says, you'll be my witnesses where? Jerusalem, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. He went global on them. He pushed them out of their region and said, this thing's global. It's going to go global. Guys, we're living in the best of times. We understand global like no other generation. We have a worldwide global internet mechanism that's on 24 hours a day. We can talk to people on the other side of the planet right now if we wanted to. Right in your seat, you can talk to somebody in China if you wanted to because you've got the technology. This is amazing. And these are the words we're starting to hear prophetically around nations. God is doing something global. Everybody's got a part to play. It's not going to be poured out in one nation, one city. It's, not, it's going to be a nameless, faceless movement of God of massive abundance called the harvest. That's where we're going. I thought you'd be more excited than that, but... I thought it was pretty good. <laughs> you get to play. You get to play. And now for the message this morning. I just had to get that out because it's what's been running in me. Yeah, God's power grid. Turn to Matthew chapter 18, verse 19. We do have slides for this. Matthew 18, 19. In God's power grid, which is how we hook up to his abundance, it starts with the power of community. The power of community. So in Matthew chapter 18, verse 19, Jesus said, Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Wow, talk about abundance. Talk about power. Power of two. Two of you, he said. If any two of you shall agree. 
Symphoneo is the Greek word. Symphoneo is where we get the word symphony. A symphony is, is actually, it means to come together in an intricate pattern to produce one sound. One sound. God is producing a symphony in the earth. It's going to be one sound. We're all going to be hearing the same sound all over the earth. It doesn't matter what language, what culture you come out of. God's getting the body, as we say, singing on the same sheet of music. <laughs> We're all going to be in God's orchestra. We're all going to be emitting the same sound. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. And I'll tell you what, we're all going to be singing that song. And it's going to be, it's going to be resounding in the earth. And this is this thing he says, if any two of you shall agree on earth about anything they ask, plurality, making the same music together, boom, abundance comes. It will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Or two or three. Is that a formula? Can we have four? How about six? It's not a formula, okay? Let's talk about plurality, together, community, building community. From the smallest, two or three, to the largest. Where community develops, it creates the presence of God. He said, there I am in your midst. When, when you have community, boom, he shows up. And when his presence shows up, guess what? His power shows up too. Then you can tap into the power. The power of community, pulling together in the same direction, symphonio. We don't all walk in with our own sheet of music and say, I want to play this, I want to play this, I want to play this, I like this, it's my favorite song. <laughs> Stop it. You're all going to play off this piece of music, okay? We're all going to play our parts and make one sound. That's the power of community. That's why these little announcements, they're not just up here filling up time. They're going, we have a mechanism at South Bay and other churches to create community. Small groups coming together, building community, getting on the same song sheet, <laughs> same vision. Anything? Anything we ask? No, there's balance to that. You know that. Not just anything. Anything we ask, not selfishly, but according to his will. Always like, God, what do you want? Too so often we get together, like, only two or three agree, we can get whatever we want. It's like, no, God, whatever you want. We come into unity, power, the abundance flows when we find out what he wants. And he said, man, I will give it. We elevate as the church. We go to an upward call. We go from a meeting in a building to creating something called like a tribe, a family, a tribe. And when we get together, man, it switches heaven on. We switch heaven on. Do you realize in the power of community, you can grab one person where two or three are gathered, grab them, say, let's pray, let's agree. God said, his word said, let's go here. Boom. You switch heaven on. In that little threesome, you can switch on heaven and pull down God's abundance. Right there. Right then. In the parking lot. somewhere You don't have to be in a building. It can happen. And then look at the next verse. Verse 21 and 22. For where two or three are gathered in my name, ha <laughs> ha, there I am. There I am. I love that. The power of God from the presence of God. So then good old Peter show, says, okay, based on that, his great theological mind kicked in. So Peter said in verse 21, um, so Lord, let's, let's, let me see how this works. So how often then, since we're doing the number thing, <laughs> two or three, I, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Because see, in the Jewish mindset, in the Talmud, it was three. Three was max. I mean, literally three strikes, you're out. You never forgive more than three. Three is like ultimate mercy. So how many, Lord? Seven? He kind of throws a seven there. They'd leave you like double and one more. Seven? Peter thought he was being totally off the charts. And Jesus said, I can do better than that. I'll go to another level. I'll, I'll see your seven and raise you 77. Peter asks on one level. Jesus always responds on another level. He says, no, I don't say to you seven times. But 70 times 7. It's not about numbers, everybody. You know that? It's not about numbers. The issue was, you got to do, Peter, whatever you need to do to preserve the unity and the integrity of the community. Whatever it takes, Peter. Even 777 and 7 tenths. <laughs> it's not about numbers, but he's just trying to make a point here. 
kind of went lunatic. Peter, 490, whatever, exponentially, that's how you forgive. Why? You can't break the power of community. If you break the power of community, you break the power grid. And you lose the abundance. <laughs> it's a great way to stop the abundance of God. The principle is you have to sometimes go to an extreme church because extreme times call for extreme reactions. And there's going to be demands made on of us in, in the kingdom of God <clears throat> to do some extreme things we've never done before. We're living in extreme times. So we have to go to a different level. Jesus would be saying, Peter, you want to get in on this? <clears throat> you got to go to another level. Because the call of Christ, biblically, is an upward call. It's always an upward call. Never takes us down, never leaves us the same. It is an upward call. So the power of community. And then there's the issue of order. This is really big. This is governmental. <clears throat> in Acts chapter 14, verse 23, we see Paul bringing order. And he said this, <clears throat> or he comments on this out of Acts. When they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. When they had appointed elders in every church, say every church. Every church needs elders. Why? God's order. It's God's order. It's the issue of order. You can't have God's power grid and do it disorderly. you got to stay under God's order, the way he ordained things. It would be another word for appoint, to ordain. Remember, God's, God said in, clearly in the very beginning of Acts, just, this thing's all under heaven. And it's not for you to know the times and the seasons, but you better do it my way. You better do it under order. And God's order was go and ordain elders in every city. Titus, chapter 1, verse 5, Paul told Titus, set in order the things that are lacking. Set in order, Titus the things that are lacking, and ordained elders in every city. Same thing. Set in order the things that are lacking. Interesting word. That word is only used one time in all of the New Testament. The root word, orthosis, is used in other places with a different prefix. But this whole idea of setting in order is to, it, it, you would say it this way in the Greek, put back into place the things that have slid out of position. Like, a, like, a, like an orthopedic doctor will take bones that have slid out of place and they put them back in position. So Paul's saying, listen, the bones of the body got to stay in position. If it gets out of order, you got to slide them back in place. <laughs> so this thing will work. Titus, what? I'm leaving you in Crete. Why? So you can set in order the things that are sliding out of place. <laughs> Do you know spiritual things? If not dealt with under God's order and authority, they slide out of place. Did you ever notice that? Been in church more than a week? <laughs> yeah. They slide out of place. Families, that's God's construct, a family. If you don't set some kind of order and authority in your family, things are going to slide out of place. Sometimes those kids slide right out of your house. The physical law is what we call the law of entropy. Entropy simply says, everything's decaying. Everything is breaking down. Everything is decaying right now. This table is decaying right before your eyes. You can't see it. You may never see it. But trust me, it's decaying right now. Now, if I put a banana up here and you came back next Sunday, say, Lord, what happened to that banana? Same thing's happened to the table. They just do it faster. Bananas just do it faster. But <laughs> it's a law. Everything decays. Everything's sliding out of position. The whole world is diminishing. This is where we're headed, folks. We can't make it great again. We can't fix it because God put a system in called gravity, entropy. These are the laws of God that he put into creation. We're moving toward the finish, which is the ultimate finish of the church. And he's sucking everything towards him. It will all, we all, all y'all, as they say in Carolina, all y'all are going to be in him. That's where we're going. Say, where am I going? In him. He's going to suck everything into himself. That's like, my mind can't handle it either. This is a big deal. <laughs> but if authority doesn't exist in the church, things are going to slide out of place. Things are going to diminish. What's the answer then? Bible answer. 
appoint elders in every church. Trust me. He didn't say go preach messages. Go start another series. He said go ordain elders in every church. It's as simple as saying go put parents in every house. Seriously. We want a harvest of lots and lots of kids. Good. What about the parents? We don't need parents anymore. We're just going to have harvest, harvest, harvest. It's going to slide out of order. <laughs> oh, of course. It's as simple as saying make sure there's parents for every kid because <laughs> they need it. It's God's way. If a church doesn't exercise what we call biblical eldership, things will diminish. Things will slide out of place because God designed it that way. He never designed all the weight and care to fall on one individual that we pay a meager salary. <laughs> he says, here, you're the professional. You do it. No, God put elders in because he loves the church. Put shepherds in because we're his sheep. And the need is to have a long-term building dimension so we can do this for a long time. Not just pop up try it for a couple of years, fold up, go down the street, try it again. An elder, presbyteros, that's where we get actually the word presbyterian. Different forms of church government were named after certain Greek words like, I grew up in the Episcopal church because of the Greek word episkopos, which is where we get the word bishop. So they run with a hierarchy of bishops. They really ruined a good word. Episkopos is really a functional word. It's what elders do. They oversee the sense of touching, shepherding, touching, watching. It's a great word. We just messed it up. <laughs> Elders, presbyteros. Doesn't mean they're all Presbyterians. But Presbyterian churches rule by a collegiate group of elders. Because it's biblical. And it just means senior one. A senior person. There's an issue of ranking in the minds of God. Let's put some senior men in there in the, in the family to take care of the family, to put government and order and so there can be abundance. The, how many know the kingdom of God is an ordered society? You think heaven's in chaos? Somebody's up there trying to figure it out? Heaven is completely ordered, totally. The church has a pattern of order that God gave. Recognized ranking, recognized internal government. This is God's ways. And they bring seniority with their position to bear upon the church. It has nothing to do with age or time or how many seminary degrees you have. Those things all help. But it's a senior position. A stable position. A place of security. There are some necessary things that have to be imparted to us as the church to keep it from sliding. Impartation. Not just good Bible teaching, we need that too. All those points on, the, on your next series, every one of those are vital to church life. But you got to understand, they don't just come from the screen into your brain. They come through impartation, person to person. I know it's convenient to sit at home on a foggy morning and watch on the internet. How y'all doing? I see you in your pajamas. <laughs> That's your third cup of coffee, by the way. Stop it. Oh, you're staying up for the Super Bowl. I mean, that's so convenient. They're just sitting there, kick back, going, and they're going, honey, can they see us? Can they see us? But you need impartation. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. There's things that seniority imparts. I get to see my granddaughter tonight, our newest one. She turns one soon. And you know what? We're not real conversationalists yet. But she's going to be on my knee and I'm going to impart my presence, my seniority, my white hair. <laughs> I'm going to impart my position as grandfather. Impartation. And she recognizes it. She has no idea what my middle name is or how much money I make. But she knows I'm Bop Bop. She knows. The third part of God's power grid that we have to grab hold of. We look at God's power grid and how he's, gonna, he's going to supply abundance in this final move of God. Well, we need the power of community. We need order through elders in the house. But we must understand also then authority and how it works, how it works through representation. God's authority is what we want, and we saw that. It's not for you to know the times and seasons, but 
God has set all this under his authority. So how does that work, Jesus? How's that going to work? Well, you're going to receive power from the Holy Spirit, and this thing's all going to work on one word, representation. The power of representation. So I'm going to take you to a little story in Luke. Luke chapter 7. I'm going to look at this quick little story. Luke 7. How you receive one who is in authority is how you receive from God himself. How you receive from someone that's in authority over you, that God puts in your life, will reflect how you actually receive from God himself. Say, I want to tap into this abundance thing with God. God goes, I got a little test for you. I'm going to put a human <laughs> between you and me. And you go, God, can we just bypass the other humans? Just you and me, God. Just you and me. These humans drive me crazy. It's like, I can barely make it through a service on Sunday morning. <laughs> and then I just get to back in my quiet time with God. You know why it's quiet? There's no other humans challenging you. And then when God starts challenging you, you go, I'm changing channels. <laughs> Holy Spirit's, me I'm, something's going on. I'm not receiving right. Oh, you're, <laughs> God's just trying to get into you. Watch how he inserts other humans into this story to represent Jesus. Watch this. Luke chapter 7. After he finished his sayings and the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now a centurion had a servant who was sick and at the point of death. He was highly valued by him. And when the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent him, watch the connection, the centurion, okay, heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews, representatives, asking Jesus to come and heal his servant. So we got a bunch of humans involved. We got a sick servant, we got the centurion who's a soldier in charge of hundreds, we got these elders of the Jews, and we have Jesus. And when they came to Jesus, who's they? Well, when the elders of the Jews came, representing the need of the centurion, they came to Jesus. They pleaded with him earnestly, saying, listen, he is worthy to have you do this for him. Come heal his servant. His servant's sick, so he's worthy because he built this nice church. He's one of our top tithers, you know. Oh, and he loves our nation, and he, they, they put all his credentials on the table, right, to impress Jesus. How many of you ever done that? Get your little list of things you've done okay. God, I did tithe two weeks in a row. What do you want? He's worthy to have you do this. He loves our nation. He's the one who built us our synagogue, and Jesus went with him. He said, okay, I'll come. Not based on that, but I'm, I want to show you guys something. Verse 6, he went with them, and when he was not far from the house, the centurion now sends friends. First he sends the elders of the Jews to go get this guy, because he's not a Jew. He's a centurion, he's a Roman soldier. And then he'd come into the house, and he was like, ah, they're coming. He sends friends out, representing him. The centurion sent his friends, and saying to him, the friends saying, Lord, don't trouble yourself, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. Watch this. <laughs> but say the word only. Just say the word. That's authority. Say the word and let my servant be healed. That's all it's going to take. Say the word. Wow. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. Isn't that how it works? Jesus goes, you're the first person that's ever said that. I haven't found that mechanism running in anybody in all of Israel. And Jesus called it faith. He goes, I have not seen that power grid run in anybody's mind in all of Israel till now. He's got it. The guy gets it. He understands God's power grid. He understands the authority of representation. He's got it. Bing, it's done. <laughs> and he was. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, turned to the crowd, followed him, and said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. In the Greek, it's called mega faith. So I want mega faith to believe for a big miracle. That's probably the biggest miracle you could ever believe for. 
to understand authority, understand God's power grid, to understand the authority of representation. It's amazing. Jesus, do you know in this, in this rendition of Luke, Jesus never met the centurion? They never had a face-to-face encounter. He sent the elders, then he sent his friends, but he identified with Jesus. I too am a man under authority. He recognized that Jesus was also a man under authority. Jesus understood the power of representation. He represented the Father, didn't he? He represented Rome. I'm a man under authority. You're a man under authority. Come, let us reason together. (laughs) That's how it works. I just say to my servant, do this. This one, do this. Do this. this. Why? It's by my word of authority. Because my words have authority because I'm under authority. Does that make sense? You can't cast something out in Jesus' name if you ain't under Jesus' name. That makes sense? You can cast and cry and whine, but if you're not under God's power grid, if you're not tapped in, it's just a cliche. It's an abracadabra. Jesus marveled. Jesus received those elders and their message, and he received his friends as though the man himself had come. And then he said, it's done. It's done. (laughs) See, authority and submission, they go go hand in hand. We kind of are in and out of it all the time ourselves. One minute you're in authority, and the next minute you're under submission. Right, guys? You're at work all day, you're the man. Driving home, you're the man. You're talking to other cars about their driving styles, and you're the man. You're in charge. You're in authority on the highway. You pull in the driveway, you go in the car, you push that button, that door goes down, and goes, I am the man, until you walk in the house. <laughs> and someone says, did you leave your clothes in the bathroom floor? And suddenly, you're in submission <laughs> to the person in charge of clothes, whoever that is. You go from authority to submission right away. Yes, dear, pick them up right now, done. Now you're in authority. Now you're in your authority over your clothes again. You just It's in and out, and in and out, and in and out. It's kind of like... How we do it. But Romans 13 says all authority is from God. It all flows down from God. All of it. And therefore all of our troubles (laughs) in the world and all of our troubles in our schools and in families and in churches uh, begin when authority is attacked. That's when our trouble starts. And I didn't make that up. That started in God's book, first, second, third chapters of Genesis. Of course. As Jay said, you know, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. How's that all going to work? Tapping into God's power grid and getting this thing lined up. All the next seven weeks aren't going to work if we don't line this thing up right, folks. You got that? We got to line this thing up under God's authority. And then he what? Releases power. Then the power is going to come. Authority has to be received. I want to close with this verse. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. Authority has to be received. You just can't look at it and go, I don't like you. Uh, you're, you're not my authority. I just like, it's like, you have to understand, God has some authority somewhere in your life. Otherwise, you can't have God. So, Jesus made this startling remark in Matthew chapter 10, verse 40. He says, you know, whoever receives you, receives me. Now, I want to spread your thinking out to this last part of Acts when he said, you're going to receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you're going to be my witnesses in Riverview and Hillsborough County and Florida, United States, to the other most parts of the world, and you're going to go global. You've got to think that way. This is what this thing's all about. And Jesus said, whoever receives you receives me. See, you're a you're representative. You represent Christ. And if they receive you, they're going to receive him. How many want people to receive Jesus? You are the key. You're the key. You're the key. Not, the pastor, not even the pastor and the elders. See, they're not really the key. They have authority, but without your submission, they're powerless. Do you understand? It's like in a family. <laughs> you can have lots of kids, but if mom and dad don't have some authority there, they're powerless. The kids will run right all over you. <laughs> God has these amazing little structures. See, authority is not the same as power. It's not the same. Authority 
Yes, it comes from the top down. It comes from God. It comes from the top down. But power comes from the bottom up. This move of God in the earth, in the church, is going to come from the church. It's coming from the nameless, faceless saints all over the world. China, Europe, Wales, wherever it is. No more big name, big star. No more stadiums. 4,500 people have been saved on the streets of England since May. 4,500 people by church people. They didn't have a crusade. Yeah. Didn't have a crusade. Didn't have to rent a big auditorium. Didn't cost a penny. Nobody's getting the credit except the Holy Spirit. This is the move we're in. Submission produces power. Whoever receives you receives me. Whoever receives me, ha-ha, he receives him who sent me. Now we tap into the ultimate source of power, the Father. We are recipients of the power to send. How's this gospel going to get to all the nations of the earth? The power of sending. God's power grid, we tap in, we get lined up under authority, then guess what? People realize that they're, they're tapped into something. I don't see it, but you know somebody, you have something, what is it you got? And say, I'm just representing him. You receive me, you get what he's got. If you receive him, you go to the top dog. You get daddy on the throne. You get father power. You get ultimate abundance. You understand? That's abundance, folks. In him. It's all very simple. You gotta stay plugged in. But to plug into Jesus, you gotta plug into people. Sorry. Not just the internet. You gotta plug into some people. So these next few weeks, plug in. Plug in. And we say, plug into South Bay. How do I do that? With your my iPhone. They just showed us how to do it. No. Plug into some other people. Relationships. Life. Wherever two or three are gathered. He says, I'm there. I'll be there. Jesus is going to show up at every small group you have. Because <laughs> he said he would. And when he shows up and the presence of God comes, the power of God comes. People are going to get healed. This other movement of evangelism in the south of England, they're partnering with this network that I work with called New Wine Wales, and their DNA runs with healing and prophecy. And so the guy that God's using in the south of England to roll out this massive move of really supernatural evangelism says, God told me I need to partner with Wales first, and then we're rolling it out into Europe. Because they are not only just saying, you can be saved, you can be healed. You can be filled with the Holy Spirit. You can all hear from God and prophesy that's your next topic about being prophetic people. This stuff's rolling out, folks. I just want to be part. You can't stop it. But I want to be a part of it, don't you? I want to pray for you. I want you to stand this morning. And I'm not going to pray. This ought to be good. The guy's not going to pray. It's the end of the service. Aren't you supposed to do that? Isn't that the religious thing to do? I'm going to speak the word only. I just stole it out of here. I'm going to do it with the center. Just speak the word. Why? Just got to have faith. So if you need healing, some of you might be like the centurion. I, I, got, a, I got a loved one. I got a friend. I got an employee. They're really sick. I'm sick. <laughs> I, need, I need someone to go get Jesus and have him come. No, you don't. That's one method. But see, we're on an upward call in Christ. Jesus has taken us higher to where we can speak the word only. Speak the word only. And my servant will be healed. Will you not just pray, I hope it's good and I hope it happens, and reposition yourself, reposition yourself, and let Jesus flow through you right now. Whoever that person is, just put them on your screen. Be an intercessor right now. Stand in the gap for them. Stand between God and them and their need. That's an intercessor. Lend your access to them this morning, right now, and we just say, in the name of Jesus Christ, be healed. We speak the word. For we are men and women under authority. We speak the word and we release Christ into a lost and dying world. To the glory of God. To the glory of God. To the glory of God. 
Amen.